Hi, I'm Barbara Moran, the Environmental Editor at WBUR. Welcome to the very first fall program at WBUR City Space. I am thrilled, like really thrilled, to be moderating a conversation today with two of the most important voices on the natural world and the role that we humans play in it. Elizabeth Colbert and Helen McDonald. And I just pronounced Elizabeth's name wrong. Elizabeth Colbert and Helen McDonald. See, I'm so nervous to talk to them. We'll be taking your questions throughout the hour on Slido. Just go to slido.com and type in the hashtag tell me more. So hashtag T-E-L-L-M-E-M-O-R-E. -E -E. And you can also purchase their latest books, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, and Vesper Flights by clicking on the link to Brookline Booksmith on the chat. So with that, Welcome very much to Helen and Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming. Elizabeth, sorry I pronounced your, mispronounced your name. This I'm so aflutter with talking to both of you. So um, I was thinking all weekend about how to start this conversation and then the uh, idea fell in my lap this morning with this ripped from the headlines um, bit of news. So I'm going to read this to you and because it really touches on a lot of both of what you um, have been writing about recently. Okay, so this was published in National Geographic just a couple hours ago. The headline goes, mammoth-elephant hybrids could be created within the decade, should they be? Okay, I'm gonna read the very beginning. Harvard geneticist George Church has co-founded a new company with an audacious goal to engineer an elephant that resembles the extinct woolly mammoth. The company named Colossal aims to use woolly mammoth DNA to make a hybridized Asian elephant that could thrive in Arctic climates, All right? It gets better. Colossal's long-term goal is to convert swaths of today's mossy tundra into the grassy steppes they, were, they once were during the Pleistocene epoch, the period of multiple ice ages that ended about 11,700 years ago. Some scientists hypothesize that at large scales, this reversal could reduce future climate change by slowing the thaw of Arctic permafrost. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I'll let just... John take that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I just want to become like, you know, Jeff, Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park here and start making <laughs> that face. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, that's possible and it could happen. Um, what, what fascinates me most about this story is, is this conjuration as a kind of virtual time traveling, right? Let's, let's turn X into Y let's let's recreate an imagined landscape you know no matter what what science this is based on i think it's you know my my own work tries to kind of think about the reasons we value certain landscapes and creatures the way they do and why we do that and the reasons we do that tend to be all about us and i, I just feel like you know no matter what you know even if there is extreme ecological sense to this in a way that i don't quite understand um I think we need to take into account what's motivating this. And it, it reminds me a little bit of the whole kind of like, you know, billionaires wanting to go to space and Mars kind of thing. It's like, let's do that. Let's not look after what we've got. That's kind of my my worry about a certain kind of aggressive um, uh, genetic kind of imaginary kind of utopia of, of, of sort of solutions. That's, that's what worries me. But I'd kind of love to see one of these creatures as well, so. <laughs> What do you think, Elizabeth? Well, I, I do think that, um, you know, it's being called, well, all sorts of things, genetic rescue, I guess, maybe. Um, you know, it's on one level, it is it is sort of further along than you think. Um, I'll give you one story um, that did get a, a fair amount of play. It's pretty recent within the last year, definitely, maybe just the last few months. Um, there they you know the black-footed ferret is a really really endangered creature in the u.s and every black-footed ferret that exists now was bred from a really small population of i can't remember it's seven or nine individuals i think it's seven individuals but in the original group they had nine i believe and two never ended up contributing genes to this gene pool but they contributed a cell line to this gene pool and just recently a company, and this is another great, you know, aside, I guess, that I believe works on cloning your pet, um, cloned, the, you know, this black footed ferret, I think her name is Elizabeth Ann, um, from this ferret who, you know, had not contributed 
her genes to the ferrets that are alive right now. And the hope, obviously, is that Elizabeth Ann will, you know, will grow up and mate with some ferret. And and so that gene pool will expand. Now, you know, that's pretty sci-fi. That's pretty futuristic. Um, how do you feel about that? You know, I mean, I guess it's cool, you know. Uh, and, you know, so much effort has gone into, and a lot of this effort has been, honestly, you know, down the tubes. I mean, they... They take these ferrets, they breed them up, they put them out on the landscape, they die of plague, sylvatic plague. So another, the next step or a possible next step is to try to gene edit these ferrets so that they're resistant to sylvatic plague because it's really hard to you know, catch them all. And, and I think you can do it with a vaccine. But anyway, um, so you know, on some level we are heading in this direction already. Um, but on another level, I, I think that I'm not holding my breath to see this, you know, mammoth. Elephants, you know, have a very long gestation period. So I, I don't expect to see personally this, you know, mammoth slash Asian elephant. But I do think it is, you know, increasingly we're going to be confronted with questions slash creatures like this. I was thinking more on a, on a sort of less maybe sci-fi level too about things like the chestnut tree, right? You know, this sort of, we're looking at, you know, trying to maybe revive this tree and looking at, you know, ash trees as well, right? It, with, you know, by genetically engineering resistance traits in them, possibly from other species. And, you know, it's, it just brings to mind a lot of questions that I know both of you think a lot about, about our, what does that mean about our relationship to nature? Yeah. Are these natural things anymore? Yeah. And I don't know, I guess you guys, you guys are the ones who think about this so much. What's yeah, it, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a really fascinating thing to think about. I mean, I, 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 I think my big realization on that was driving around in England, um, ash dieback disease had just hit Britain and I saw my first dying ash trees and um, I, you know, over, over an age when, I just vaguely remember the shapes of elm trees on the horizon when I was a kid. They're like a kind of weird dream that I had, you know, and I, I see them in movies. I see those those kind of thundercloud shaped canopies and I feel a kind of longing for what's gone. And I think that longing is an incredibly powerful force. It gets tied up with nostalgia. It gets tied up with an imagined sort of utopian past. And as you know, politically, the notion of going back to a time when everything was better is is can be a quite a dark force and um so i i mean my own my own view on it is that it's it's really interesting because a lot of these um I, I have nothing against genetic engineering at all i mean i think the american chestnut is a fascinating uh case that i know elizabeth has, has worked on this and and you know that, that you have kind of genes from trees that aren't american right that are being <laughs> people are kind of worried about how american these chestnuts are really going to be so to me it's not only a kind of really interesting an important kind of question, but it's also about the natural world, but also about us. You know, what what is it that 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 we are seeing reflected from these 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 attempts? That there's about longing and about loss and about what going back to a time and about and about you know nationhood. It's really interesting stuff. Well, I, I actually have, as as Helen suggests, I've I've visited these genetically modified. Um, uh, chestnuts, they're not, they're sitting in greenhouses and in fenced in plots, not that far from, from where those of us in, in Massachusetts are, they're out in Syracuse, New York. Um, and they have basically a single gene, a wheat gene, a gene from wheat that allows them to resist this fungus. And there was a long, for a long, long time in chestnut circles, and I think this is what Helen's alluding to, there were they were trying to backbreed this tree with Asian chestnut trees. And then they were going to get a resistant tree and then they were going to breed in more and more American chestnut in until you got this sort of resistant American chestnut tree. But it's, there's a couple things that happened along the way. One is it just didn't work. So that was, that was a problem. <laughs> and B, you have this point that people would make, well, if you got that tree, and even though that would have been done with sort of a conventional breeding method, that was going to be less of an American chestnut, you know, the same species as this American chestnut that's been genetically modified with just one 
uh, reaching. Now, I have heard even more recently that it's possible that, that, that this gene that they want actually exists in the chestnut gene. It's sort of just not turned on. So it's possible you could just get the tree to turn it on. And then, in, in fact, it might not even be considered a genetically modified organism. But all that being said, it's working its way right now through federal approvals. Will it get approved? I don't have the answer to that. But when I went in to write that story and went out to Syracuse, I, you know, was probably had the same visceral reaction that many, you know, listeners are having right now, like, well, I don't know. But um, now I feel like if I could buy that tree, an American chestnut tree with one wheat gene, I would plant it in my in my yard. And the American chestnut was such an important part of New England's ecosystems that, um, and now as, as you suggested, Barbara, we're now seeing all of our ash trees die owing to, owing to emerald ash borer. What are we gonna do about that? That's even a more difficult thing, even if we wanted to genetically engineer our way out. That's, that's a really hard one because it's an insect pest, not a fungal pathogen. So these questions, I mean, I hate to repeat myself, but you know, they're just going to keep coming up more and more because as we move stuff around the world, we just get, you know, our, our forests are just being devastated. There's now there's the, the spotted lanternfly, which is moving through the Northeast and is, has a tremendous range of trees that it can kill. So it's, it's a, a bloody disaster and how we're going to react to that, you know, pesticides, you can douse some of these, it's hard to douse a whole forest in pesticides, but you can, and some of, and those are terribly destructive, you know, so the options are, are not good in, in sort of any direction. Mm. It is really scary. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I, it wasn't too long ago where I realized that I had been, without even thinking about it, just assuming that massive biodiversity loss was just what happens. You know, it was like you get older and you get gray hair and you get wrinkles. Like, as you get older, you just lose everything. And there was this moment where I'm like, wait, <laughs> like, you know, it's it's not. Uh, it's not a done deal. It's happening. Climate, the climate emergency is, you know, obviously terrifying. But this notion that it's, it's, the, you know, one has to face it with equanimity and, and in a totally fatalistic manner is a very easy trap to fall into. I, I found myself feeling like that. Sorry. No, it's really interesting, Helen. It makes me, it reminds me of something you wrote in your book about this, like children today, growing up with this idea that the sort of rapid ecosystem change and rapid biodiversity loss is just the way that the world is and it's i don't know that's a it's heavy that's a heavy a heavy thought yeah 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 i mean i talk about my um it is frightening i mean I talk about my, my niece when she was very very small I and mean, i mentioned in the book going for a walk in a piece of remnant uh wet marshland near where i used to live and it was you know brimming with life you know it's really loud with insects and birds and she turned to me and said you know, when they made this place, where do they bring the animals from? You know, and I just didn't understand what she meant. She said, did they come from a zoo? And I just realized that, you know, for her, it really is the case that most of the agricultural landscapes that she knows are empty. There's just nothing in them at all. It was a really bad moment. So, yeah, we're fighting against that, too, that 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 sense of shifting baseline and that sense that, um, you know, the stuff that I remember I mean, I remember laughing at my parents when I was small and they all used to be in the fields. And now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm saying the same. It's, it's pretty scary. Hmm. Hmm. It's, uh, I, I'm just thinking, because I had a similar experience with my kids. I bought them up. We went to Iceland and I bought them up to see a glacier because I was like, this may not be here the next time we come back. And they're like, eh, so what? You know, you're, you're always talking about glaciers leaving. I thought it's, I don't know. I mean, maybe. Maybe there's a resilience in the next generation or something. I don't know. Or I, yeah, it's hard to know how to how to feel about how to feel about that or what 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 the next generation. I don't know what they'll have to to deal with. Well, if you told me they couldn't go skiing, I mean, there aren't too many glaciers <laughs> left in Massachusetts, so you know uh, there haven't been for you know ten thousand years. So I don't think that most kids in Massachusetts say, "Oh, you know, I really miss those glaciers," <laughs> um, and I'm sure my kids wouldn't say that. But but they miss, you know, in the course of their own lifetimes, you know, skiing season has 
contracted. Uh, so they missed that for sure. That's right. Hit them where it hurts, I guess. Exactly. Um, just a reminder to our audience that we are here with uh, writers Helen McDonald and Betsy Colbert um, talking about nature and humans' role in it. If you want to send us questions, go to slido.com, S L I D O.com, and use the hashtag tell me more. Um, both of you have, have written about how we humans are at a really unique moment in history now, where for it's about the last 10,000 years, you know, during the development of human civilization, we've had a really stable climate, right? And now we are entering this era of an unstable climate. And do you, I guess, how do you, how do you deal with that information? Like, how do you process that information day to day other than, you know, you're writing about it, but do you ever get overwhelmed with that? And how do you try to communicate such a big long term scale thought to, to people? Well, I think <laughs> that's a really good question. I mean, I think that, you know, the way I try to communicate and I assume that I speak for Helen when I say when I say this, um, you know, we, we you know, we tell stories that we hope people um, are gripped by on some level that could be, um, you know, because it it gets them where it hurts, as it were, or it could be on a more, you know, into intellective level. How's that? Where or sci-fi even? You know, what's the future gonna gonna look like? And um, in the case of you know, what's gonna happen when we leave, you know, the, the relatively stable climate of the Holocene, which, you know, some people would say sort of we already are. Um, and I should point out that many people would say we only have, you know, what we count as civilization, the great civilizations of the last 10,000 years, very, per, you know, permanent settlements, big cities, etc. you know, writing, all those things, uh, metalworking, because we had a relatively stable climate. So that's a pretty sobering you know, thought. I mean, humans have been around for quite a long time. I think the latest estimate is 300,000 years or so. Um, but the ice ages, which we got through, you know, um, were very climatically unstable and people moved around a lot and people, you know, were very itinerant for most of human history. And now we're not very itinerant. And how you deal with climate instability in a point, at a point of time where there are national borders you can't get up and leave you know we're not we're not hunter gatherers anymore um we're very dependent on you know large large scale farming uh to feed the world i mean if you do want to have nightmares you can start thinking about how this will play out it's it's very hard to see a scenario in which you know the wheat belts of the world, you know, and we're already seeing obviously refugee crises for all sorts of reasons. Some people would say seeing the beginning sort of a climate migration. Um, so it's a pretty sobering and um, yeah, potentially scary. And how do I keep my own, you know, self from panic? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have always lived in a state of you know, close to panic. So, so maybe it's just your personality. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's terrifying. Uh, so in terms of sort of day to day managing it, um, to me, it's it's exactly like the sort of fear of mortality, which creeps up on me sometimes at 3 a.m. and I wake screaming, you know, it's one of those. Uh, generally, I'm kind of, I try very hard to uh, keep hopeful in the way that I think Rebecca Solnit and others have described that if you're, you know, if you're very, very, very optimistic, you don't do anything. And if you're very pessimistic, you don't think there's any point in doing anything. And you have to work really hard to keep that space open for uncertainty about the future. And, you know, and you have to work hard to be hopeful, you know. And, you know, I have to kind of say that, you know, there are there are days in the month when I'm feeling pretty hormonal where I just want to climb under my duvet and weep. But, you know, and there are other days where um, I look at what's going on. I look at activism. I look at, you know, again, this is another classic, you know, cliche, but young people that get raising their voices. And I, I, and I feel better. But, you know, like, you know, 
in the last few weeks, we've had the British government, you know, just done a trade deal with Australia and Australia asked them to water down all their climate um, promises. And Britain was like, yep, no worries, fine. You know, so it's it's hard to maintain that hope in the face of just constant misery, miserable news. Um, you know, I but I think that the stories that I think Betsy and I are telling, you know, they're being joined by others. You know, I've been recently talking with the uh, film director, Denis Villeneuve, who's just re uh, released the film Dune. And he's really been explicit about the fact that that is that film is about adaptation and about climate change. You know, it's an ecological parable. The original book was and even more now it's about coming together to try and, you know, um, you know, what do you do when the, the environment you're in is inimical to 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 to, to, to he, the, the, the structures of human life that you're used to. So I think the stories are, are widening and they're appearing in other in, in more and more places. And I just um I don't know, we just gotta we just gotta come together and raise our voices. You know, I'm I'm not a campaigning writer. I'm not very good at that. I I don't like being told what to do. Ask my mother. Um, I tend to do the opposite. So I'm not very good at telling you know you should do this. But uh, what I try and do in my own work is to point at things and try and um, get in the reader a sense of the astonishment that is the natural world and how it works. Um, just as that first step towards thinking about you know the complexity of it all and how utterly necessary it is. So that's really my job is to try and instill awe in love and wonder which is everything but it's something <laughs> i think it does quite a bit um so we we have a, a question this is for you helen uh from a, along those lines from an audience member um oh. i was wondering if helen could talk about the experience of watching the northern migration at night from the empire state building which you write so beautifully about in your in your book <laughs> It was mind blowing and it was great. I went, I went, I went to New York for two days to do this in May and the first night, luckily for the second night, the first night was was deep fog. I mean, really high that, you know, the cloud base came right down, the fog came right up. And I went up the night, I went to the Empire State Building at like 11 p.m. And it was illuminated purple that night. And I wondered, there was no one else there, obviously, because you couldn't see anything. And all the security guards were like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I wandered around, I was like, okay. And then the next night, because of that fog, you know, the the um, the air was clear and suddenly this huge bottleneck of migrating birds that had like spent the days waiting for the weather to, to be right there. It's a lovely wind pushing them um, north northeast. And I went up there with a guy called Andrew Farnsworth from Cornell and um, we stood there like amateur astronomers and it was one of the most astonishingly moving experiences of my life, you know. Um, you know, realizing that, that that the air is to start with an, an ecosystem of its own. You know, there's, there's a whole discipline called um, aeroecology now, which studies the kind of movement of living things in the atmosphere. And also just it changed how I thought about cities as well. You know, cities, once you get up about a certain number of feet, there's not really any distinction between the city and, and anything else that's underneath, you know, or a forest, really. And there I was, you know, with the Hudson and planes going into JFK and, you know, there was a jazz band playing and I was watching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of warblers um, and other birds moving over and they were being uplit by the city. So they were like, it was like slow tracer fire, you know, watching them. Um, and just thinking about the frailty of those bodies and the ways in which they were navigating and that will that was pulling them north. Um, I cried, you know, I cried my eyes out. And um, and again, it was that sort of sense of of strangeness and of, um, you know, that that we just look around. The, it's a bit like the kind of consciousness, you know, our brain is predicting all the time what we're going to see. And that's what we see. And, we, you know, I wouldn't have predicted this. That amount of life up there was it was it felt like being a submersible going in, into the deep sea. But the other way. It was absolutely astonishing. And if you ever get a chance to go up there in spring or fall, it's even better. And bird watch, I, I think you should do it. That's amazing. Uh, Betsy, do you have, um, I know in your books, you you travel, you're always traveling all, to all these amazing places and talking to all these scientists. Do you have a favorite that sort of jumps out at you of a places that you've gone that inspire that awe for you? Well, I would say the most amazing thing I, I've ever seen was um, the coral spawning on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I, I, this was about uh, ten, 10 years ago already. Um, I went to the Great Barrier Reef to a, a research station on a small island in the reef, and we went on a night snorkel uh, 
the night there's sort of one night it's not one night it's really spread over a bunch of nights but you know some nights are better than others let's put it that way and it was an amazing sight and i was actually just for the for my more recent book i was actually just back in australia for the spawning again but this time i saw the spawning in a lab um they had brought a lot of corals in to tanks because they were and wanted to manipulate them in this hope of sort of breeding super corals. Um, and even in a tank, even in a tank, coral spawning is an amazing sight. They release these um, little beads that contain a lot of corals or hermaphrodites. They release both eggs and sperm in these little uh, bundles that look like pink glass beads and they uh, rise up to the water. So it, it, it's similar sort of, it's a little bit like what Helen was saying, it's like being in a snowstorm, but it's upside down. It's like having a snow globe around you. Uh, and but everything is rising up. So it's it's a it's a beautiful sight, and it is also um this amazing, you know, sort of ritual, synchronized ritual, and no one's exactly sure. It seems to have to do with the moon. Uh Coros can sort of sense the light. Uh, timed very exquisitely so that they all do it at the same time you watch one do it and then they all do it so it is an amazing uh it does cause you to reflect on how uh the ama- the miracles of evolution i mean what is what has been uh the answers that to the question of how to how to survive on planet earth many many answers to that question i really want to see that <laughs> Yeah, it's it's spectacular. One day. Um, along those lines, that gives me, uh, brings us to another audience question. So what species, this is for both of you, what species are most in danger of becoming extinct in the near future? Or what do you, you know, in your travels around, what do you worry about mostly? What, what creatures? So many, <laughs> the list is so, so long. Um, I, uh, I mean, in, you know, to go back to reefs for a second, uh, you know, reefs are terribly endangered. Um, really, the Great Barrier Reef has lost like half of its corals roughly over the last 30 years. So that's pretty grim. I don't know that people would worry about individual species of coral going extinct because they're so numerous you know a a single coral is you know the size of a i don't know a a pinhead basically a bit a bit bigger but anyway um but you know losses of whole ecosystems are is what i i guess i guess i'd say i'm worried less about you know, individual species. So Lord knows those two. And I'll give one example and then I'll turn it over to Helen. I I wrote about um, the Sumatran rhino, which is a spectacular uh, species, one of five rhinos left on planet Earth. Um, And the latest uh, estimates of how many Sumatran rhinos there are left are under 100. And so there's all sorts of questions whether they should all be taken into captivity, whether there are even any out there not to take into captivity. But they have very complicated mating cycles. They're very hard to breed in captivity. Um, So that's a species that I had the opportunity to, quote unquote, hang out with a Sumatran rhino. And uh, that is a magnificent species that could tragically be simply gone, gone from planet Earth uh within the next decade or two so that's a a tragedy of sort of epic proportions that really is um i guess when i when i think of this question i mean i i the first thing i think of is just the question of scale you know i mean sumatran uh rhinos this is gonna like a criticism of sumatran rhino as a choice and it's really not but it's that sense that you know we we can we sort of look at animals that are kind of on our own scale as the ones that we kind of our eyes, our eyes and our hearts are stuck upon, and I mean, you know, the the when I when I think of this question, what species are most in danger of being, you know, com- becoming extinct? I just think of the uncountable number of species we don't even know about that are disappearing. You know, insect species. You know, there's stuff disappearing all the time, and we have no idea. And that those losses are the ones that I think frighten me almost the most. 
The other thing that, um, and, and again, ecosystems, thinking of it in terms of ecosystem loss rather than as individual species loss is also, I think, really um, a very useful thing to, to sort of tr try to kind of get one's head around. In terms of like species that um, I personally worry about, some of them are pretty common, you know, so, uh, but, you know, there are things are happening. So, for example, some albatross species that are fairly common, but they habitually nest on very low-lying oceanic islands. Um, those islands are doomed from sea level rise. And, you know, there are some translocation programs going on. But I think there's that sort of situation where you can look at a, a bird, for example, that has, you know, there are kind of, you know, there's a million of these things, but they're still threatened and they can disappear very, very quickly if things go the way they look like they're going. So it's not just the super rare creatures that that worry me. It's the ones that the world is going to suddenly tip um, in a way that makes their existence untenable. And that is a different kind of fear for me, that too, the common things disappearing very quickly. It's all cheer here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to, I'll, I'll switch it away from the gloom and doom in a minute. But uh, is there, I mean, I wanted to talk a little bit about the unknown consequences of sort of species going extinct. And I, I feel like there's, you know, when you see something huge like a rhino or the right whale going extinct, there's that sort of sadness because we can relate to it some way. Or, you know, some people talk about the insect, you know, the honeybees are going, you know, the well, if the pollinators go away, then we're in trouble. So it's like putting us in the picture and to try to make people care that way. But I mean, what, how, I guess, how do we, I, I don't know. How, I, I'm gonna, I guess I'm trying to ask like, what are the, what are consequences of extinction that people are maybe not thinking of? Or what, what do you, other than that, you know, there's sort of like, the sadness and loss, but what what else should we be thinking about when we think about extinction? Well, I think that that is the big, you know, the big question mark, the sort of, you know, to quote Donald Rums, the late Donald Rumsfeld, you know, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And, you know, there's a famous formulation by Paul Ehrlich, which I, which I will repeat, and I think it's a a use, potentially useful, I should say, way of thinking about things like, you know, if you're on a plane and you pop a rivet, uh, okay, so you're not happy, but okay, the plane still flies. There's a lot of redundancy that's been built in, you know, two, 10, okay. But at a certain point, your plane is going to fall out of the sky. And we don't know, you know, we don't know where that point is or what the species or species doubtless that are keeping this you know planet of ours afloat you know but um i think it's almost certain that they're that they're out there <laughs> and uh as helen was saying the thing that's very very scary and there's a a list of birds i think it's kept by the maybe by the cornell ornithology ornithological laboratory it's called it's called common birds in steep decline you know it's just common things and you know we we've seen that in here in new england you know bats little brown bats very very common animals i mean in the last 15 years or so owing to white nose syndrome which is this fungal pathogen you know bat populations are down by 90 percent now people try to sort of say well okay that will um, you know, that's bad for, in, you know, because bats eat insects, that'll have an impact there. But of course, insects are declining too. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, when does it hit us where it hurts? Um, at that point, you know, things are, um, it's too late to worry slash do anything about it. So I think with all of these issues, these big, vast global issues that are about you know life and death for us and for many and the millions of other species with whom we share the planet. I guess the only point that I can make and can't emphasize enough is you know if you're just going to sit there and wait until the food system collapses, I can assure you it will be too late at that point to take action. Um, ditto the climate. If you're just going to wait until you know we're all underwater, until Boston is literally underwater 
uh, to do anything about it, uh, that's too late. So that's why scientists have really been desperately trying to get us to pay attention mm -hmm. and why people like Helen and I are trying to sort of translate some of those concerns to a more general public. Um, because, you know, if you sit there and say, well, I don't really see how this affects me right now. You know, there's some truth to that, you know, for better or worse. I mean, we've been lucky so far, you know, our food system hasn't collapsed yet, but it's not the sort of thing that you want to really uh, play around with. Yeah, absolutely. All that. Um, I could just say that's that's it. That's all. <laughs> but um, I guess that that question about the, the facility of telling stories that that uh, you can stack against science, you know, I, I mean, I, I try really hard to when I write to, um, you know, I read the read the science papers, but then you know I try and produce a qualitative sense of of what we're losing. So you know you could talk about we've you know for example Germany's lost seventy five percent of its in insect biomass since the mid nineteen nineties. I mean that figure is terrifying, but it doesn't mean anything if if you you know it maybe mean you don't get as many wasps annoying you if you're having you know jam sandwiches outside. But then you know. It, in my book, I talk a lot about swifts, these wonderfully aerial creatures that are really the kind of uh, sort of genus loci of summer skies in Europe, and people love them, right? And they've declined precipitously because of the insect um, loss, and also because people, without knowing it, are blocking up the holes in their houses and renovating houses and make, making it impossible for them to nest. So I just want to kind of point at things. I want to point at things that are that might not be noticed and say, look, look at this um, as a way of kind of, you know, you know, we're not good at thinking in terms of systems when we're, we're just not very good at it. We are good at thinking in terms of individual lives and what we notice in our own biographies. And that's why I try to talk about visible animals for people to to learn to love. That's it's not much, but that's what I, I try and do. You keep saying it's not much, but it's I think it's a lot. I mean, it's this idea of giving people something to care about, right? I hope so, yeah. I mean, it's a truism, isn't it, that you don't want to do anything to protect things if you don't don't know they exist or you don't love them. So, I mean, I, I went, we went to a, a talk on newts once. Actually, it was a great talk. It was one of the, by the one of the most boring people I've ever met, ever, ever heard in my entire life. He was great, but he was so boring. Everyone was kind of tuning out as he was talking about these gray crested newts, which have become a huge problem in Britain because um, they're, they're globally very, very rare, but they're quite common here. And they're so endangered in a sort of global sense that, you know, if you find one in a pond in an area that's going to be built on, it stops the building project. So people, you know, the, the sort of generally the kind of sort of right wing people hate newts. It's kind of a joke here. Um, so, and he, you know, he was great, but, you know, someone asked the question, you know, if we, we know people are not allowed to touch these newts, they're so endangered. You're not allowed to pick one up, you know, you're not allowed to interact with it at all. It's, it's against the law. And, he, and someone sort of said, well, look, if we can't see them or touch them or get anywhere near them, what's the point of them, you know? And I was like, oh my God, that's a terrible thing to say. But then I thought, no, that's a really good point. You know, why is anyone going to care about these little squidgy animals with orange tummies? if they don't know anything about them. And it was a real moment, uh, an eye-opening moment for me that. That's super, we have a similar thing here in um, uh, New York with the, the piping plovers, or maybe they're pronounced piping plovers with, you know, people just loathe them because they can't walk their dogs on the, on the beaches, right? But once they get to see them and they're so cute, then, you know, it kind of starts to flip that a little bit. Um, just a reminder to our audience that we are taking questions for Helen McDonald and Betsy Colbert, um, two writers on uh, the natural world and humans role in it. You can go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com and type in the hashtag tell me more. Um, we have a question, a follow up for you, Betsy, about um, what we were talking about a minute ago about the food system. And can you, can you talk a little more detail about how the food system might collapse? Well, you know, our food system depends on um, this health of the soils. There are tremendous, you know, microbial um, communities in the soil, which I think no one would, in, by any stretch of the imagination, would suggest that we understand. They also depend, you know, we spend a lot of time killing it pest insects, but a lot of um, pest insects are killed by other insects. I mean, the insect world is a, you know, 
a dog eat dog world. Um, a lot of insects are being parasitized by other insects. So, um, you know, there's a real question as you uh, douse the world in pesticides and as as insects various of various forms um, seem to be taking a pretty big hit for reasons that you know we can't entirely agree on. Uh, are you going to unleash um, you know insect plagues that you can't control? Uh, disease. We're constantly moving you know pathogens around the world. You know the ash tree doesn't happen to be um, a, a commercial crop, although you know in some timber timbering. I'm I'm not a lumber person. I can't tell you if there are people commercially growing ash, but but here I'll tell you the spotted lanternfly, for example, which is a new arrival from. Um, from Asia uh, and has is doing phenomenally well um, and expanding very rapidly. That attacks apricot trees, plum trees, peach trees. I believe uh, a lot of um, fruit crops. So there are so many ways in which we are um, playing. I guess I would say Russian roulette with our food supply. Um, climate change is obviously you know, looms over everything really um, in a very scary way. You know, in, if you live in the American West right now, uh, you and you're a farmer in Arizona, you, you may have seen your entire water supply cut off because they're going into what they're calling a tier one shortage down there. So, um, you know, that's three, four or five different ways um, that we're messing around with things. And the other point the other you know key point to make is that we you know our our own our human population is still a growing population so you know you have even just to keep pace uh you, you need to be growing more food so we're really um you know as as you can look through the scientific literature and every week there's a new kind of dire warning um playing playing with with fire to to sort of use a bad pun so um, absolutely, I just want to jump in and say you know, all that and more and and also just, you know, the sort of brute fact here in Britain that, you know, I went to the supermarket this morning, the grocery store to, you know, get some, I've got these new parrots, I had to buy some fruit for the parrots and some vegetables. And the, you know, the, the supply chains are breaking down. They really are all over Europe. It's not just Britain. Brexit has made it worse, of course, but, um, you know, the whole just in time supply chains that were basically driving consumption here in, you know, the in restaurant industry and like hospitality and supermarkets, they're all absolutely messed up now. And, you know, it's this sort of notion that that too is a consequence, you know, to be brute about it. You know, this pandemic is, is, was the result of basically incursions into kind of, you know, pristine old growth rainforest and, a lot of viruses out there, they rise into the air like dust, you know. So, you know, I think that the, there can be vast catastrophic events that can that could trigger something like the collapse in the food chain, as well as these kind of, um, you know, insistent, um, you know, augmentations of kind of disaster that that Elizabeth is, is talking about. Lantern fries are very pretty, though. I was amazed when I saw one. I was like, oh my! God. I know, I know. I hope to not see one, but I I fear that I'm going to see one soon. Yeah, they are. They are. They are. The pictures do make them out to be quite lovely. Um, I was I was wondering if um you two would mind talking a little bit about um your writing. So like how how your your writing process a little bit and how do you decide what to write about and how do you actually do it and do has it changed you know since you're writing about climate nature has it changed over the last you know years as climate change has become more apparent and that and as the the general public has you know come to understand that it's happening now has you I mean, do you still feel like you have to get warnings out there or have people got it and then you can turn a little more into problem, you know, to like a problem solving now? Or do you still feel like you still need to be alerting everybody that climate change is, is happening? And then how do you, just yeah. as a writer, how do you, how do you actually, you know, how That's do you it. put it all together? I think people have, have got it now, don't you, Betsy? I think there's, there's a sort of, there's been a shift in the last year or so. I don't know whether it's a pandemic or whether there's been this just barrage of terrible fires and floods and hurricanes. I mean, do you get a sense that the there's been a shift? 
Well, you're maybe lucky that you're in the UK. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that the, the, the issue, definitely the people who read, you know, me and most of my stuff appears in the New Yorker. So, you know, the people reading the New Yorker, I would say, get it. But, um, you know, now we're getting into sort of a big sociology question that I can't exactly answer. But I do write I, I write with this sort of, because of my audience, kind of write with the theory that you basically get the basics, but I don't, that doesn't cover a lot of the US, has that? Right. Um, sorry, I butted in there. I suddenly got really, well, I got really uh, excited about that question. Shall I, shall, I, shall I sort of kick off with an answer, Betsy, and then? Please. Okay. Um, Writing wise, yeah, the stuff I write now is more political because it's not about just me, whereas my last book was, uh, which was basically a memoir. And um, again, it's not kind of yelling political stuff, but I, I think, you know, again, trying to unpick and uncover the valuations that we give the natural world and how much of those are about us. And in terms of kind of like making conservation distinct uh, decisions, often completely and utterly ridiculous, you know, how we value some things more than others. In terms of writing, why, how I write, I mean, some of the pieces in my in the book, I've just uh, there's been you know just been re, re, uh, released in paperback um, by a wonderful Grove Atlantic. So the some of them are commissions. So some for sort of New York Times magazine, some for kind of um, the New Statesman here, and they've been kind of elaborated and rewritten a bit for the book. Some of them were, are written really, a lot of them are written really because I've seen something or I've felt something out in the natural world or reading about the natural world that has just snagged, you know, that sense when you think something's, I don't understand that. So when I write, I tend not to even plan. I tend to just start writing an essay and see where it ends up. It's a bit like whitewater rafting. There's a lot of panic and a lot of back, back sort of, you know, watching it at times. But the reason I love writing essays so much is it always feels to me that there's a there's someone standing right there, the reader is standing right behind me, kind of like with me when I'm writing them. They feel like a conversation, even though that's ludicrous because it's just me. They feel more generous to me than than a than a work like Ages of Hope, which was which was kind of memoir. They feel like I'm in a room full of people who are all looking the same way, and that's really thrilling. I love I love writing um, essays, um, and I don't know. I mean. You know, the, the book is full of stuff as everything sort of mushrooms and migraines and there's, you know, cranes and there's all sorts of things in there. And um, I just wanted it to be like, as I say in the book, a wunderkammer and like a cabinet of curiosities. I wanted it to be full of very different things um, that had the same kind of underlying themes about kind of loss and love and borders and migration and all these things. But but they were very different in other ways and that having all these short pieces in a book would allow a reader to kind of like just play with the differences and similarities between them as, as they read. So that's really what I do. And I, I, I just write a lot of coffee, basically, is what I need to, to write anything. I need to be off my face on caffeine is the answer. That's my craft answer. I also notice in your book that you, you let your parrot walk across the keyboard. Is that, uh, how yeah. did, does that yeah. help? It does. It I, but that parrot, alas, died in, in January and much, much more. And I've got a couple of new baby parrots and they've just discovered how to lever the keys off the keyboard and fly off with them. So it's there's two of them. So it's sort of exponentially worse trying to work with them in the room. Yeah. I love them. Um, Elizabeth, are you equally uh, over caffeinated when you write? Is that, uh, is that your... I, I'm a big caffeine addict. I do want to say there's a lot of evidence that, you know, Coffee requires very um, specific climatic conditions. And uh, so, you know, there are a lot of predictions that coffee prices are going to rise as uh, owing to climate change. I think that's probably sad. And people like Helen and I will be spending more and more a proportion of our of our income, of what we write, will go just to keeping ourselves caffeinated. Um, but I... Uh, I guess I sort of traveled the opposite path from Helen. I, I actually started out covering politics. I, I covered politics for quite a while for the New York Times. And then um, when I got to went to the New Yorker, and this is 20 years ago already, um, so I date myself, but I was supposed to write a political column, which I which I did. But I also got this idea that I was going to 
and this sounds comical now, but I was going to settle the question once and for all of whether we needed to be worried about climate change or not. And um, that uh, was a, a series of pieces of, that I wrote, um, I guess they appeared in 2005, and that really took over you know, my journalistic career because unfortunately, once you do look into climate change, and this was, as I say, back in 2004, when the consequences were actually, when it was actually a lot harder to go out into the world and find, you know, very vivid examples of the impacts of climate change. Now it's unfortunately way too easy. Um, but once you do that, once you sort of master the um, the science of climate change, and I mean that obviously on a, on a lay person's level, I'm you know, not a geophysicist by any stretch of the imagination, you realize how scary uh, this problem is. And I guess the only thing I would say, and, and this was sort of, I guess one of the motives for writing um, Under White Sky is that even though I do think that people do get increasingly um, that, you know, climate change is big, it's real, it's here. I don't think they get um, that, and this sort of goes back to the point I was making before, that processes have been set in motion that you cannot take back. You cannot reverse them in a, not just in a human time frame, you know, in a, in a millennial time frame. And that is what is going to one of the forces that I think is going to propel us or make more and more attractive or um, enticing certain really big techno fixes um, because these, the even the the incremental change, and I don't even want to say that we're doing incremental change, we're not even doing incremental change, but it just takes too long. And the system is is moving, and it's, it's moving, you know, a very scary thing that I think scientists have taken from this summer, not necessarily um, lay people either, is, you know, when you see things happening that are faster than the models, these are the gold standard in climate science, and then the models predict, then, then even the scientists get scared. And some of the things we're seeing are happening, um, you know, decades ahead of schedule. And that's pretty scary. Um, this is something, you know, that really your, your whole book focuses on, Elizabeth, and I wanted to bring up is that it, it really looks like that we're going to need some pretty large scale ge geoengineering to come in and help with climate change. And it's it's pretty disconcerting and i feel like the tone of your book you come away a little disconcerted by this and can you i mean and it's disconcerting on so many so many levels and can you just talk a little bit about you know how you you came out of the writing of your of your book feeling well, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, we're going to need geoengineering because the fact is we don't know if geoengineering could work. I mean, geoengineering, I, I will I will um, just introduce it to re to readers, um, to reader listeners, um, you know, solar geoengineering is this idea that we would we would mimic volcanic eruptions, which spew a lot of reflective uh, material in this in the case of volcanoes, it's sulfur dioxide, but you could theoretically use a lot of other stuff. You could design particles and they reflect sunlight back to Earth, back to space before it hits the Earth. And you're just literally not getting as much direct sunlight. And that has a cooling effect. So after a major eruption, we get a temporary cooling effect until that stuff falls out of the stratosphere. And the idea here is, well, we would just keep pumping stuff into the stratosphere. That would do the same thing. And it would counteract or partly counteract. Once again, it would be kind of up to us. Uh, the effects of climate change. This is a, on some level, a very simple idea, and on some level, a very complicated idea. Very complicated. No one knows. You know, the sheer mechanics of it are very complicated, and the potential side effects are extremely complicated. So I, by no means, you know, am an advocate of geoengineering. I think what I am throwing out there. 
uh, in the in the book and in many levels, which also talks about you know gene editing, some of the issues we talked about at the top of the hour. Um, you know, we have not left ourselves in a good place, and we haven't left ourselves a lot of good choices. Uh, and so, I think that our tendency is always, I mean, one response to everything we're doing is we should be doing way, way less. We should all be living way, way simply, you know, more simply. We should try to be using fantastically fewer resources. That's very rarely part of the conversation, even really on on the on the left. It's it's let's let's switch out our energy systems. These are these are techno solutions. And once you go that route, uh, you know, you commit yourself on some level or potentially you commit me. So I guess that's a question that I'm sort of asking the book to these bigger and bigger interventions. And where do they lead? Um, I think the book suggests they could lead to some pretty bad places, um, but uh, it also suggests that our choices are not great. You know, take the American chestnut as a very simple example. Your choice is between no American chestnut and a gene edited American chestnut. You know, what's you 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 make the call. You know, Helen, do you have any um? Um, no. I'm again that uh, <laughs> I'm very interested in the interrogating the visceral horror, the thought of filling the sky with particles to reflect sunlight that would change the color of the sky instilled in me when I read that that chapter. And again, that sort of terror of large scale intervention um, as a kind of symptom of how bad it is and how far we've got. And, you know, I, I mean, it really does seem that as, as, as Elizabeth said, you know, we this notion that we can preserve the pristine is kind of, you know, it's increasingly imaginary that we are working in a a world which is a coupled human natural systems everything's affected by us you know um it's imaginatively and scientifically and environmentally um just feels perilous everywhere and uh, that chapter i think of all the chapters in that book was the one that gave me the most nightmares but you know um who knows i i honestly don't don't i i can't predict um, we know. only we have um, just a couple minutes left, and just so um, we don't do what we're always accused of doing as climate reporters and getting everybody bummed out, can you? Um, what? We'll start with you, Betsy. Um, what? What gives you hope in all this? Like what? You know what? I guess yeah. What gives you hope as a reporter on this subject? Well, I, I do think I do think the consciousness. Once again, I'm sitting in the U.S. Um, I do think that things have, you know, with the disasters and especially this summer, as you suggested, Barbara. You know, I do think people are waking up. Like, you know, this this is not this ain't no fooling around. I mean, this is really serious. Um, but you know, we're sitting here, and once again, I don't want to get into the weeds here, we're all sitting here waiting to see what's going to happen with the infrastructure package, what's going to happen with the reconciliation bill. I do think, um, and I don't want to, you know, put too much, but I I, it's, it, I do feel like it's sort of now or never. If we do not get, um, you know, something significant out of this fall, and then we're facing the 2022 elections, I Really, so I hope and what gives I not want to say that it gives me hope, but I do hope that we see something uh, significant. There are a lot of smart people who know what they're doing, who are trying to make something happen. So let us hope that it does. Oh, uh, yes, again. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Did, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm a, today, again, I got kind of a little bit downhearted and because Extinction Rebellion, you know, halted the M25 uh, motorway that I did a documentary about. Um, uh, and uniformly, the response was, how dare these people interfere with the structures of our lives? And um, I don't know. I was kind of hoping, I think, that the pandemic, the way that that's the, the structures that are unshakable about where to, how we work and, you know, traveling and stuff like that. I just sort of hoped that somehow that would shake us up a bit about, you know, what is and what isn't necessary in terms of how we see our lives. But I'm not so 
I'm not so positive about that in my head anymore. I mean, to me, the, the, the way that I deal with hope is, you know, it's not only kind of looking at the kind of activism that's going on that's, that's really essential, but also to, to look at, and again, this is kind of like a bit of quietism, I think, on my part, but I, I look at local uh, habitat and ecological restoration projects. I look at people who've taken areas of rye grass and transformed them into thriving biodiverse meadows, and it takes work. Um, but every single patch of those things, I mean, it might mean nothing on a global environmental scale. I mean, climatically, they're probably going to disappear if things go the way they do. But just the sense that people are trying is what keeps me going. Um, and people from very unexpected places doing their utmost to just kind of retrench against what's coming. It's it's where I, a lot of my hope sticks. Right. Thank you. That's a really nice note to end on. Thank you, Helen. So thank you so much, Betsy and Helen, for your time today. And thank you, viewers, for your questions. Um, please go to the City Space website, wbur.org slash events, to see our full fall lineup. And you can also purchase Betsy and Helen's latest books, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, and Vesper Flights, by clicking on the link to Brookline Booksmith on the chat. Thank you both so much for this conversation. It was really wonderful. Bye, everyone. Thank you.